That's what the Germans meant with Arbeit macht frei, work shall make you free. The outgroup is always lazy. So the hierarchy of value in fascism is determined by social Darwinism. Well, first, I just want to say it's great to be at Harvard Bookstore as a graduate student at MIT making $10,000, 10 large a year, and uh, I, I, I spent it all here. Spent it all here. <laughs> well, obviously, that the spending of, on, on, of your money on books here made quite a difference because this is really a phenomenal book, and I imagine that many of the, the ideas that you engaged with here went into it. It's a sweeping kind of account of fascist politics ac across time, across nations, across cultures, um, to really help us kind of understand some of the critical developments that we're dealing with today. And for me, and for, if, I don't know if you've, some of you have read it or not, but I, um, I started reading it during as the Kavanaugh saga was unfolding and as Kavanaugh was getting confirmed, and um, it really, that it couldn't be, this could not be more timely. This, this book is so imperative, and so I'm really looking forward to our discussion today, but also urge all of you to, to read this book and engage with, um, with, it, with its ideas. It's really beautifully written and incredibly moving, but it's also terrifying. Um, I think terrifying, especially in the context of the m more recent developments. Um, and despite the fact that it, it's terrifying, it's written in such a way that it's also enjoyable, if any of that makes sense. Um, but anyways, okay, so, so, so. And it's I've greatly affected by your, <laughs> your book. Well, thank you. <laughs> um, I, so when I, as I finished the book, the results of the Brazilian, the Brazilian primary was kind of, and the, the, the idea that we're kind of in this moment where far, far right nationalism is really rising globally. We see it in Russia, Turkey, the Philippines, and now it looks like Brazil is about to elect a, um, a fascist or a neo-fascist leader. Um, the book is about fascist politics. It's not about fascism. It, it, um, it looks at the, t at the tactics that fascists use to come to power. And so each chapter kind of takes an in-depth look at a single strategy that's involved in, in fascist politics. So to get everybody on the same page, can you give us like a Cliff Notes version of the, the, the tactics and the strategies that you discuss so beautifully in the book? Excellent. So, so, uh, so the first is uh, the mythic past. All fascist, uh, fascist politics is a politics of emotion that connects, uh, that, that tries to sort of connect people's fears and anxieties uh, to some target, to some mythic target. So to some, uh, because all the different strategies involve undermining truth. So they all, un that's a common theme from all of them. So there's always, so the idea is in the past, the dominant group and the men in the dominant group in particular were, were venerated just for being them. They got special, they got special rewards and special respect. And so you present that to people and you present their feeling of loss and anxiety. At, you connect it uh, to this thought that they've lost this past. Uh, they, and, and so then you, cr you create nostalgia for a past that never was. Making America great again. The, the uh, Elizabeth will add the, the Trump <laughs> slogans to each chapter. So uh, <laughs> the uh, chapter two, is uh, is propaganda. There's a special kind of of uh, fascist propaganda. Like we're familiar with it. Uh, someone tweeted on my account the other day. Um, you know, you say things are really bad, but I read that book 1984. And it was much worse then. <laughs> but uh, so so we're familiar. We were familiar with it from <laughs> from like war is war is peace. Uh, you know. Uh, so from Orwell, but there's this inversion, this characteristic inversion. There are certain things that I was very surprised about when I did this research. Um, uh, elements were, were in literature, gen I've relied a lot on work in feminism, so Kate Mann points out in her great book, Down Girl, that, uh, that you know, when men run against women, they tend to call the women corrupt. But in the literature on national socialism, you find this discussed a lot. You find uh, uh, Richard Grunberger saying, you know, we like to think of the Nazis 
as this sort of pure anti-Semitic people group that just like was just devoted to killing Jews. But in fact, most of them were just mafia thugs who uh, who just wanted Jewish land and property and art and didn't care at all about whether they were killed or not. You know, and so they were just mafia. And so they weren't. But they all fascist politicians run anti-corruption campaigns. But they're always much more corrupt than who, and Bolsonaro is an example. So it's just this really, Putin, his 2011 campaign was an anti-corruption campaign. And it, you know, I, if Putin's listening, you're a great guy. But uh, <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, that joke didn't go well over in Ukraine. Uh, over well. <laughs> so like, Don't say that about Putin here. But uh, so, uh, so, uh, so, you know, uh, Putin is by some measures the wealthiest man alive. Um, so, uh, but he always runs anti-corruption campaigns. So anti-corruption, uh, you know, of course, Trump, <laughs> crooked Hillary. Uh, so, uh, so, uh, so you get this inversion. The fake, the news is the fake news. Um, uh, chapter three, anti-intellectualism. So here I'm, I, I, I was doing, uh, through, you know, being at Yale involves living through the country's traumas every year. Um, which seem to be played out in the Yale campus. Uh, but so, so we experienced a lot of these attacks on the universities in the 2015 student movement. And so that made me aware of this sort of like thing in the United States, of like attacking students for being like, you know, for, and, and then going after gender studies. And then I read Masha Gessen's 2017 book, and she breaks down the attack on gender studies. S St. European University of St. Petersburg closed because of gender studies. Central European University closed because of liberalism, cultural Marxism, and gender studies. So there's this n international attack on universities for being hotbeds of Marxists, liberals, feminists. Um, so chapter three is anti-intellectualism. The idea is, uh, this is, the idea is, you know, you attack, you attack institutions that teach all of history rather than just the dominant perspective. Um, and you, you find this interesting thing that far right, uh, I've gotten in a little bit of trouble with, for this saying this, but Hillsdale College, a bunch of these far right institutions, they all have great books programs. I'm a little leery of great books programs. Like, you know, because, you know, there, there's this emphasis on these are the great, you know, the white men are the great minds. So, you know, even, I mean, I love Plato as much as the next person, philosopher, but it's just, you know, really imperative that universities teach the full spectrum. If you if if you don't like fascism, you really need your universities to be teaching the full spectrum. Okay, chapter ch uh, because fascist myth tries to tell you, you know, the dominant group is responsible, as Hitler said, for all of of uh, all of civilization, and so you do not want your university curriculum to back that up. <laughs> so, uh, chapter four, unreality. So the first time I broke out, I used to write on the left parentheses. And uh, my old colleague, Jerry Fodor, said, hey, even the semicolon isn't safe from you guys. And uh, so then I broke out of my academic shell when, I, when birtherism came. And that was, that, you know, being, uh, so I, uh, I was familiar with the protocols of the elders of Zion. There's a trap you do with conspiracy theories. You, you say, the press, the Nazis said, the press is controlled by the Jews. You know the press is controlled by the Jews because they don't report that the press is controlled by the Jews. So that's why you know the press is controlled by the Jews. Uh, Trump came fo on Fox News. He says, CNN's controlled by Obama. You know CNN's controlled by Obama because they're not reporting that Obama's from Kenya. So that's how it works. So the goal, the goal in all this politics is to displace truth. Um, you know, Du Bois is clear, the last classic last chapter of Black Reconstruction, the propaganda of history. You know, you want you want to turn history into a device for glorification, into a political device, and you want to undermine truth. And so that's the goal of all of this, all of this politics is sort of to replace truth by myth. Um, uh, chapter five, hierarchy. So liberal democracy involves uh, the it centers on the values of liberty and equality. Um, and this is another attack on truth because the fact is we all pretty much suck in roughly equivalent degrees. And so if you say that one group is better than another group, it's another lie. And so then you need, so this is, then you need a myth to support that lie. Um, and the idea is that the, the hierarchy of the dominant group is a fact of nature. Uh, equality is a myth. And anyone trying to promote equality is really trying to displace the dominant group, to seize, the, to seize power. Uh, 
So uh, chapter, then victimhood. Uh, uh, the dominant group is always the history's greatest victims. Uh, so uh, 18, I begin that chapter with Johnson's 1866 vetoing of the Civil Rights Act, saying that this will establish more protections for the colored race than, than you know, 1866, uh, uh, than is ever, you know, terrible discrimination against whites. The Germans, the Germans were the greatest victims under a, a huge percentage of fascist um, propaganda involves the dom dominant group victimhood. Uh, you can say Merry Christmas again. <laughs> That's uh, so. Uh, chapter seven. Uh, what are they victims of? Well, this is this chapter is deeply indebted to Elizabeth's work. Uh, it's called Law and Order, um, and so uh, Elizabeth's work on Nixon. Uh, I teach it in my propaganda classes. It's an essential work of American history, and uh, so I talk. So law and order. Law and order doesn't mean law and order. <laughs> it means the outgroup men. Are are by na by their nature criminal. Uh, uh, what crime do they do? Well, quiz. What do the outgroup men do? That's so horrific. Well, rape, right? That's a nonstop feature of all of these, uh, and it's so the chapter eight is called sexual anxiety. You raise at the center of fascism is patriarchy, uh, because the the as I tell my three year old, uh, in fascism there's one big daddy. Um, so the idea is the you you evoke patriarchal norms, uh, and then you get people to feel like they need they you panic because they're not protecting their women and children, and then uh, and then that strengthens patriarchal norms from the outgroup men. And uh, uh, so Tim Snyder said something on our Wednesday conversation that was important insight. He said the crime of rape can only be done to the in-group women. The outgroup women can't be the opponent. The outgroup women, and that relates to some of the, uh, and and so uh, so if you look at like Myanmar with the Rohingya, uh, the Rohingya were all put in in consigned to like 180 some villages after three Rohingya men raped a ranking woman in 2012, and then this five years of incredible propaganda against them. They're rapists, and then what was perpetrated against the Rohingya? Genocide, ethnic cleansing, and mass rape. But because they're rapists. So uh, chapter nine is called Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, the rural populations are often the social basis for fascist movements uh, are regularly. The politics involves an appeal to the rural areas. Chapter two is of Mein Kampf is my struggle, my, my time in Vienna. And one thing, one thing I, I discovered that was wild is that the outgroups always live in the cities. I mean, very typically. So the Jews are associated with cities. Um, you know, uh, the, the uh, you know, as Hitler says in Vienna, Jews, Jews, and more Jews. In Romania, Jews were only allowed to purchase property in the city. The cities were places of homosexuality. And, and, and in America, in my own country, the expression inner city is actually is connected, I think, with outgroups. So then chapter 10 is called Arbeit macht frei. And I owe this to Tim Snyder, who said to me, yeah, he suggested that title, and he was like, you know, when white people call black people lazy in the United States, that's what the Germans meant with Arbeit macht frei, work shall make you free. The outgroup is always lazy. So the hierarchy of value in fascism is determined by social Darwinism. So, so hard work gives you value. Laziness gives you no value. So the outgroup is always lazy. Jews were lazy. They need to be made to force... For, they need to be forced to work for free, and then this would purify them, if you're familiar with that ideology. Um, so, so that's the social Darwinism. What gives you value? What makes you, uh, only the makers have value? To use our American way of phrasing this, the takers don't. Um, and so, uh, so value is determined by hard work, and then you attach that to groups. So certain groups are just hardworking. That was an amazing kind of Cliff Notes version of the book. It's fantastic. Um, so if you, you, everybody should read the book, but if you don't read the book, at least you know that the strategies of fascist, of, of fascist politics. So one of the things, and you mentioned this um, in your response, I, what really struck me about the book is the kind of, the implicit tension existing between um, principles of liberty and equality. It's something that I'm kind of like obsessed with as a US historian. Um, you know, 
there's only been really two moments in our history where the principle of equality has actually been kind of the guiding force of domestic policy, of course, the Civil War, and then 100 years later during the Civil Rights Movement. Um, and so I, so I guess my question is kind of a two-part question. One is, um, is it possible to reconcile? I mean, you talk about the ways in which for fascists, equality is kind of a denial of natural law. Um, so can liberty, ideas of liberty and equality ever be reconciled? Um, what would that look like? And then this is the crisis of democracy question that I think is related. Um, has, an, this is just, I wanna know what you think. Has America ever been, given what you lay out in the book, have we ever been um, a true democracy? Have fascist politics always been in play? Is this, is there, there some kind of break that happens in kind of mid-century or, um, or is, this, is this something that's kind of existed um, for all along? Yeah. In the middle. <laughs> right. so, the, the, so you asked two questions. Yeah, two questions. The first Sorry. question is not a softball. It's one of the central <laughs> questions of political philosophy, like how do you rectify liberty and equality? What are the tensions? Right. Uh, and I didn't prepare a, a lecture to respond to that. Uh, and since five minute answer, you did such a good job with the whole book in <laughs> uh, two minutes but or ten minutes. Liberty. I mean, I think that I think that correctly understood, there isn't a tension. So correctly understood, I think that's the official philosophy response that you're supposed to give. So I think political equality is, uh, political equality, you know, um, liberalism involves political equality and political equality involves the capacity to speak truth to power. And so political equality should be, should be, uh, it, you know, that is liberty. Uh, so political, and, and if you read the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, Susanna Siegel earlier today told me I shouldn't constantly quote the Protocols of the Elders of Zion to like, <laughs> as, as a source of uh, insight. But, uh, but uh, the, uh, the uh, Protocols of the Elders of Zion goes back and forth between liberty and equality and basically treats them the same thing. They're like, if you infect, so the Protocols of the Elders of Zion is written as if it's a hoax, written as if it's Jewish advice to other Jews to sort of undermine the power, the the white Christian uh, power, and replace it, and like spread uh, s spread liberalism to your opponent, spread the doctrine, uh, s spread the doctrine of uh, of freedom, and uh, and then of political equality. Of, of uh, they so they treat them the same way, and then they will share. Because what is liberty? Liberty means that each of us can do our own thing. So that means that we have to be given the space to do our own thing, equal space to do our own thing, and that's equality. So, uh, so, so there shouldn't be a tension between the two. And when there is a tension, you know someone's messing around with freedom. Um, so, uh, so uh, uh, to, to, to the second one yeah. question. Um, I'm, I'm so uh, the uh, the the um, I mean your work shows. I mean. You know, when I for, in the midst of writing this, our team, like the left, like the Corey Robbins of the world, are, were like, oh, like everyone was responding to this, like, oh, not another goddamn, not not another, like, oh, the fascists are coming book. Um, but so, but it's a trick, <laughs> it's a trap because it's not written like this. It's like, no, we are the fascists. <laughs> and uh, oh, sorry, I mean some of uh, 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 the, I mean there are fascist, strong fascist elements have forever been here, um, and if anything, they were imported to Europe. Uh, Hitler in mein, in mein Kampf, Hitler's, the Mein Kampf is an argument for the, na for the national state to replace, to replace the bureaucratic state, the liberal state by the national state based around nation, based around national identity. And he says, uh, you know, when he looks for a model, his model is the United States. He says, he says, uh, he starts out, he says, nothing is more uh, nothing is more uh, horrific and humiliating and embarrassing in the world stage than Germany's immigration policies. So he rants. He says, "You know, nothing. You, you know, our immigration policies are the laughing stock of the world." Okay, I'm just doing this so you recognize it. Um, so, uh, so then he, uh, then he says, uh, "Is there a model? Yes, there's a model. Uh, the, I, I do not mean here. I mean the United States, which, uh, which in its immigration policies uh, does not." Uh, referring to the 1924 uh, Immigration Act and also the uh, the the immigration policies in the 1880s, um, they do not allow they only they restrict their immigration to select racial groups and only admit uh, uh, foreigners uh, who are who are healthy for who are who are good from the health point of view, which is you need to bear in mind given the new immigration uh, 
uh, regulations that they're trying to pass, which involve very strict health requirements. Um, so I think that, and of course, Jim Whitman's book, my colleague Jim Whitman's book, Hitler's American Model, um, the Nuremberg lawyers studied are, because of the sexual anxiety, the fascism is a politics of purity. So all fascist laws, the first fascist laws are always like anti-miscegenation laws. They're always no mixing, like the Nuremberg laws. The Nuremberg laws were patterned after the Jim Crow anti-miscegenation laws. Of course, they decided one drop was insane, was, sorry, untethered from reality. And uh, I'm trying to be less ableist. Um, and, uh, and so they said, okay, let's go with one-eighth instead. We're not going to be that extreme. So I want to I wanna switch gears and kind of think about, or ask you some personal questions, I guess, or, or cl questions yeah. closer to home. Um, one of the things I really liked about the book is that there are moments when kind of your family background comes in. From the opening lines, you talk about your grandfather um, visiting the beaches my of Nor or your father, father visiting the beaches of, of Normandy, um, and in the end, you talk about your grandmother who wrote a memoir about dressing up as a Nazi social worker um, in concentration camps. And so, I would just love to hear some about what dinner conversations were like in your household and how that shaped your view of the world and the ideas that went into the book. So, so as uh, uh, they, sh they deeply shaped the ideas that w went into the book, uh, our mutual friend Donna Merch said to me, you guys with your Hitler, 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 but now you're actually helpful. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so uh, the, uh, so, um, my father was a sociologist who uh, started off in African studies. Uh, he wrote his dissertation in imperialism, like part two of Hannah Arendt's Origins of Totalitarianism. Uh, then he shifted to sociology after eight years in African studies. Um, he, uh, uh, so my mother and father both are refugees. The question of survivors complicated. My mother grew up in a Siberian labor camp. My father lived through Kristallnacht and was almost seven when he came. But both my parents came on, past the Statue of Liberty on boats. Um, but uh, they, they, there was a conflict, I think, in my family. I've written about this in a piece for the New York Times called My Parents Mixed Messages on, on, on the Holocaust. Um, uh, my mother, who experienced this horrific post-war anti-Semitic time in Warsaw that Jan Grosch has written about, um, she also was a court stenographer in Manhattan criminal court for 33 years. And so she regularly experienced uh, the racism of the United States, and it strongly reminded her of what she ex experienced in Warsaw. And so the things she said to me were very, although my mother thinks, as I've written about, my mother is not someone who thinks, okay, you should stand up and fight it. She's, you know, you should flee. <laughs> you know, she's always, you know, she's like, it's, they're always going to get someone. When, when is the time, you know, to learning when the time to leave is. We're, we're like, learning when the time yeah. to leave is was yeah. a, was a big feature. Mm -hmm. Whereas my, my father, German Jewish, and my grandmother went into Sachsenhausen 400 times, dressed as a Nazi social worker and took 400 people out. Um, and so there was a very strong, you know, um, ethic of, uh, you know, what our identity and background means is that you should look to see who are who's oppressed and and who's um, and he didn't tolerate me talking about our family being. I mean, there's a co it's very complicated. The politics of survivor and that expression is really complicated because they weren't camp survivors. Um, but he would always orient. Like I remember one time I was talking about our family background and he took out James Baldwin's piece, 1968 piece, Negroes are anti-Semitic because they're anti-white. And in it, Baldwin says, um, uh, "We, you think you connect with us more, speaking to Jew, Jewish people, Jewish Americans, uh, white Jewish Americans, um, that because of our shared history of oppression. But we know you're glad not to be us. <laughs> so we actually, uh, you know, we resent you more. Um, so, and I found that to be true, given my family. Um, so, uh, so, but I think just." The way I grew up, there was always like um, a feeling of uh, that very, very, very bad things can happen, mm -hmm. and uh, and and probably will. And <laughs> so, so is that feeling part of the motivation for writing this book at this moment? Uh, I think um, I th I think uh, 
the, the feeling, the, the, the recognition of the patterns. I mean, from my, the, the fact, w when my mom, during the Trump campaign, my mom called, I was talking to my mom on the phone, and, and I, I was talking in some just casual way, and she said, don't say that. And I'm like, what do you mean? She said, that's how Trump talks. You don't repeat how they talk. So I grew up with a lot of that. Mm -hmm. And so, and I grew up with a lot of like during the Reagan era, mm -hmm. our, 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 our kitchen table uh, was, was, I mean, our dining room table was very much always talking about parallels like mm -hmm. Reagan's racism and, and uh, so, so uh, you know, I think people from my parents' backgrounds are drawn to that. Um, and my stepmother is also an enormous influence because she participated very much in the civil rights movement and would always made sure there was 10% for hope and I never forgot that I lived in a country in which people did that. So, and she had a huge, every time I write a book, she picks it up and she's like, okay, I'm gonna add the, the, the reference to hope. <laughs> okay, so on that, on that note, I wanna kinda close off this part of the discussion with a couple of questions thinking about that hope. Um, you know, your, your, your grandmother rescued people from concentration camps. This book opens up and um, examines kind of the heart of so many of the problems that we're dealing with in the society. So what do we do? What's something tangible? Where do we go from here? How can we fight fascist politics and prevent them from spreading further here in the United States, but around the world where they seem Well, I, to I be. think the work you do is anti-fascist work. First of all, history yeah. is, is utterly crucial. Unless we confront our own, because fascism relies on myth. And so unless we, we actually confront our own history, we have no hope. So the Amer US historians, like your, your work, your work on the Nixon era, showing us that actually this is not new, this is not, you know, that's an essential text you've written the prison reform work you're doing, the prison education work, the, you know, we have, you know, people are like, well, you know, I'm more worried about our country because of mass incarceration. I mean, Germany didn't have, I mean, we have, we have 9% of the world's prison population is black American. We, the 1990s was a, you know, we did complete fascism with, uh, <laughs> you know, super predator theory, crime is dropping like a stone and fake news complete fake news. People are getting tenure at Princeton for fake news. I mean, William, you know, Peter Beinhardt criticized my book in, in the New York Times for saying, you're not saying that William Bennett is a fascist, but William Bennett co-authored Body Count. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, you know, yeah. like oh he's, yeah. the, he's the one who was like, we should publicly execute drug dealers. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. so we need to do the work. And of he's all about the roundup. I mean, yeah, the, exactly. The roundup. <laughs> so yeah, exactly. So we have these, we need to go back. What we've learned is our susceptibility. Like, I think the United States is like, white people like me were like, as long as it's consigned to, uh, directed at black people, it's it's good. Right. But it never just, yep. somebody's always gonna come and be like, hey, that works. Like, people, people are fine for total lies and fantasy, like we saw in the 1990s uh, with mass incarceration. You can just tell people just, I mean, think of super predator theory. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, they can kill, rape, maim without remorse or feeling. Well, why do they want to kill, rape, and maim if they don't have any feelings? Uh, you know, <laughs> it's just incoherent on its face, and the statistical stuff was ridiculous. And that's one of the things, actually, that you do uh, really well in the book in, in analyzing some of their rhetoric, their rhetorical devices, is showing how just on the contrary and they are. And yeah, they like make absolutely no sense a lot right. of the lot the logic. Yeah, the logic which is so so I think I think what we need sorry, I was hope, hope, hope. Uh so yeah, uh, so, yeah sorry, we're getting back so, into the So going, you know, you're very inspirational to me because you are doing the deep anti fascist work, not just in your research and the history, but in the activism you do with prisons, you know, what where we have to uh, somehow unravel this situation. Uh and it's you know, when we already have these giant prison camps, you know, that are then being gonna be used for immigrants, uh, you know, we already have the law and order politics that you're the person, I mean, that's why I, Elizabeth Hinton's book is very central to this book, uh, because you're, you are the historian of, US historian of law and order politics. So you're tilting at that, we have to address our, the underlying fissures. You know, if I was Tim Snyder, what I would say, to what Tim Snyder would say is like, look, when you think about Russian influence, 
what you th should think about is the way they're exploiting the weaknesses we already have. Mm -hmm. um, and so the way to respond is to like unravel those weaknesses, like go back and make sure that we don't have those weaknesses. I mean, if you look right now at, at what, ru during the Kavanaugh hearings, the Russian, Russian propaganda uh, uh, Twitter was filled with, with the most, the hash biggest hashtag was Kavanaugh. Um, the uh, the uh, Russians are now doing all this anti Me Too stuff uh, on there and, and anti, they're trying to gin up, uh, you know, the feminists are out to get you. And of course, uh, in 2016, they did that with Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. So with Black the Blacktivists, the Facebook page. So we have to go back and we have to address the features of our society that made us vulnerable, that made, it made us vulnerable. We've now learned that, yeah, so. Okay, so once we go back and address all of these features of our society, this is a fun question. I okay. hope it's a fun <laughs> question. So what does that, and it, again, it's, it's a hard, also a very hard question, but we can have fun. I just want to dream. Uh -huh. Let's yeah. just dream. Let's dream. What does, what does an, our, our ideal society look like? What would your ideal society look like? Well, we get, I mean, maybe it is, you know, the space for. This goes back to the personal question you asked, because from my family background, we didn't talk about that. So the answer is, we, uh, we can't talk about it. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I've not, I haven't put, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know. I mean, your colleagues with Jim Sedanius, mm -hmm. who I don't think thinks there's an ideal society. <laughs> he thinks that these features are, uh, one of the things that I think my book, I, I, the reason it's a philosophy book and not, uh, and not a history book is because I'm saying that there's a certain structure that is sort of permanent in societies. Like, modern day fascism requires the 19th century, it ri requires the Reda der Deutsche Nation, it requires nationalism, which, you know, right Hegelian, there's a sort of philosophical structure from the 19th century. But a lot of the elements are familiar back to Plato, when Thrasymachus in the Republic is defending the view that it's just power, and Plato is trying to respond by saying, no, well, to respond to that, I'm going to have to defend truth. Well, that's one basis of, so, so I do, so the question of what the ideal society is, this gets to ideal. Th I I almost don't like to think about it because I think it can distract us. Okay, I'll I'll accept that. I think I think one um, you know the 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 reconciliation of what's been a tension in U.S. history, which is between freedom, liberty, and equality, so that everybody is free to have their own equal space and and do what they want, might be. One way to think about. Oh it. yeah, that would be that. that, that definitely would definitely preferable to the current the, the current yes, conditions. No, that would society. be that, that would be well a, a society where we can't think about punishment in the way that I mean for me mm -hmm. a society I mean a society where we can't think about punishment in the way in this or maybe us and them maybe that's you know abolishing right. the, the the politics of us and them. Well, so so I want to be careful about this because. Um, so the subtitle is The Politics of Us and Them. But fascism is one particular way to make an us-them distinction. There's another, there are other ways to make us-them distinctions, like the bankers versus, mm -hmm. you know, like, like, the, like the rich versus the poor. And um, some of those I'm in favor of. But, uh, but, uh, but uh, so this is about a fascist way. <laughs> Which ones are you in favor of? <laughs> uh, but, uh, but, you know, I was in Occupy Wall Street, which is a very mm -hmm. us-them politics. Mm -hmm. But it's a class-based us-them politics. Mm -hmm. And that can go horribly wrong too. I'm not saying that can't go horribly wrong, but um, but uh, when there's been longstanding, uh, when the us is the dominant group, the dominant racial group, and involves this myth of of racial uh, uh, of race, that's that's the fascist us them, and that we need to get rid of. I agree. I could continue this conversation forever, but I want to open it up to everybody else, so I don't hog you. We will take questions. A, a very quick comment and then a, a question. The comment is in listing the various fascist dictators, I think it's important to list Netanyahu who gets $10 million a day from our government. The, the it's important to list yeah. Netanyahu. Yeah. yeah. A, and Though it, it's scary always to list yeah. Netanyahu. It, it relates <laughs> to the, the uh, question that I'd like to hear. The nation state law. Look at the nation state law that just passed. Yeah, yeah, no. But what the question is more about the, the fake news and the complexity of criticizing that right-wing conception of fake news when there is real fake news from the 
corporate yeah. media that's existed forever and it connects right. to Netanyahu since nobody yeah. even knows what's going on in right. that. Well, especially in so Salisbury media. So to, right. to talk a little bit about the complexities of criticizing the right wing fake right. news, but not losing the, the other critique. Right. right. So really the question. So let me be clear about the expression fake news. We now have so fake news, the, the English expression starts off as a description of Macedonian fake news, like just total fake, false stuff, to, to, as a technical term to describe just made up stuff, uh, the Russian, Russian interventions. Then it's flipped back around because what in fascist politics, you always flip things back around. So Tim Snyder in, in The Road to Unfreedom talks about schizo fascism. In, 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 in Russia, they call, you know, Alexander Dugan calls Angela Merkel a fascist and Obama a fascist. So the fascists call the and you know now we see that in the United States where oh the Donald Trump Jr. said the Democratic Party their platform is the same as the, the Nazi Party platform. You know uh, Dinesh D'Souza, uh, you know liberal fascism. So that flipping around. So fake news then becomes flipped around and it becomes synonymous with the German usage of Die Lügenpresse. Uh, under the Nazis, where it's just like the mainstream media is the fake news. So we're talking about, so the question is, so it's not, so the question, w I think the important question you're asking is, what do we do? I mean, Trump is very sophisticated. I differ from other people and I give him a lot of credit. Um, but like, he was good on this. He was like, you know, what do you mean fake news? Look at the Iraq war. You know, our news lies. You know, and this is the thing. People think that when I'm, People think, oh, I'm just defending all the mainstream things in this book, but I'm not. I, I, what I'm doing, I mean, it, what I'm, it's especially dangerous. This is what's happening in Brazil. That's why we see such an extreme candidate as Bolsonaro, because they've had comp very severe failures of the elite. And we've had very severe failures. So when you can justifiably paint the mainstream system as corrupt, it enables fascist politics. Um, so that's why, like, you know, Hillary Clinton once said uh, deplorables and is thrown, you know, you can never make a mistake. The elite can never make a mistake because any, any, any corruption is then going to be then used by in fascist politics as a little basis of, as a basis of truth that then they can again run against. So, you know, my strategy is always to say, look, I'm white, but it's in my self-interest to fight against racism because it opens my society to fascism. <laughs> uh, you know, and I would say, you know, uh, we've got to we've got to be extra careful about being diligent in journalism and not do what we did during the Iraq War, the financial crisis, because it opens us up to to that. Uh, having a role in uh, fascism. Um, as you know, I'm interested in post-truth. Yeah. There's a, a backlash to this idea that there could be post-truth. You see it on Brian Stelter. You see it on some of the other uh, programs where they say, no, we couldn't possibly be living in a post-truth society because there's so many people who care about truth. Uh, and I think they really fail to understand that post-truth is a, is a political weapon. It's the, it's the idea that truth is subordinate to ideology for political dominance. And I wonder if you could say a little bit about that, uh, that strategy in particular uh, in uh, bringing about fascism. Okay, so, so I mean, Tim Snyder says post-truth is pre-fascism. Yeah. The, the, um, I mean, I, I think that, you know, I mean, in your work, your excellent book, um, what is the title of your book again? Post-truth, post -truth, right. right. <laughs> I knew that. It's on my syllabus for next semester. Um, so, uh, so, uh, so, <laughs> just roll your eyes. <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, so, yeah. So Lee McIntyre's, uh, uh, it's, uh, I don't like the phrase post-truth because it's too, you know, uh, this is like, as I said, like Plato's Republic involves this, power versus truth. You know, it's about power versus truth. And what you're doing is you're trying to, uh, in, in fascist politics, you're trying to uh, undermine truth because then you, you can speak, you can't speak truth to power. And, 
and you you know the fascist wants to destroy f liberty and equality equality is political equality and that requires being able to speak truth to power and liberty requires truth nobody thinks that the people of north korea are free they've been lied to they're acting on lies so nobody thinks that they're acting freely because freedom requires that you know what you're doing and you don't know what you're doing when you're controlled by lies. So if you're smashing liberty and equality, you go after truth. So, uh, so when you see, uh, when you see, so and this is a familiar dialectic in the history of political philosophy. You know, uh, so, so I don't like post truth because it suggests some novel, new thing here. When this is in fact the old issue about defending liberal democratic norms. Papers that the person behind um, Bolsonaro's um, uh, political, like uh, pretty much like it's yeah. marketing. Yeah, it was a guy who also helped Trump. Like uh, Steve so, Bannon. Yeah, well, I'm Steve not Bannon. sure on the name, but um, yeah, probably. <laughs> so, do you think? Do you consider this to be some sort of um, an influence of the United States and Brazilian politics, as we saw um, back in 2019? 60s with the dictatorship, which else, which we also saw the U.S. influencing. Great question. We have a Brazil scholar here, uh, Reagan. But uh, ah, the the but uh, but uh, I I actually don't think so. I think it's Bannon. Uh, Bannon is creating. We have an international far right movement happening mm -hmm. right now, and it's linked. Netanyahu is part of it. Putin, Orban, Law and Justice. Uh, uh, you, uh, uh, Modi, uh, uh, so and they're, they they help each other. So Bannon is doing this in 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 Italy in Europe with the move. We call it the movement, and uh, and he's very sophisticated, uh, and he's behind Bolsonaro. Uh, and uh, but it's not you know Bannon doesn't speak for the CIA at all. And in fact, you know, thank God. <laughs> you know, so I actually think that's like an instance where we're kind of lucky. Um, so I think there is an international far right movement. It involves it's in a lot of people's interests if if nationalist movements work in these different countries. Uh, and so uh, so as, as Snyder describes in his books, he's like Putin realized during the spread of liberal democracy. Oh, systems can spread. <laughs> and so, you know, so that's what's happening. We have a strong global fascist movement, and Bannon is, is one of the major ideologues behind it. And, uh, but you're right about uh, how class based politics can go horribly wrong. You only have to look at Mao or Stalin and the yeah. incredible purges. The worst or as bad as any, any fascist. Yeah, you can look at Maduro, Daniel Ortega, who originally started out. For some reason, the left has this uncanny and very frightening ability to attract. No, 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 I wouldn't call it left-wing fascism. It's just as bad. Right, I'm just quibbling. I'm, I'm quibbling. So let, let me say something about that very important point. So when you look at the literature on authoritarianism like the 50s, like Arendt's origins of totalitarianism, I think there was a mistake made. Like Arendt in Origins theorizes communism and fascism together. And I think that was a tactical error because th although both can equally end up in horrible consequences, they look different. So, like, Arendt never mentions patriarchy in all of Origins of Totalitarianism because she's trying to theorize Stalin and Hitler together. And you cannot theorize fascism without strongman patriarchy. But you can theorize Mao, you can theorize some of the communist authoritarianism without that. So I think you obscure how each bad thing works by theorizing those anti-freedom movements together. Yes, they're both anti-freedom. Yes, there's going to be, they're both species of the same genus, but they look very different. And so I explicitly chose just to talk about fascism and not to talk about, uh, you know, because frankly, the left-wing authoritarianism, I don't view as a terrible danger in the United States. It's a terrible danger in Venezuela. It's a terrible danger in other countries. But right now, what we face is this, and with Bolsonaro, with, with this n worldwide movement, right. 
I really I was disappointed because when uh, I read the title of the coming of the fascism, I thought you are going to use this opportunity and the fascist policy of Zionism and imperialism against Muslims who, who are the victim of this time yeah. yes. and who is involved yeah. pushing for wars. The same victim, those who are still playing the victimization card against other groups. And I don't understand why you didn't. I mean, this is again, we go back to Hitler. That is done in the past. How many centuries are we talking about? They are talking about the same thing and pushing for their agenda. They are using the same thing. I thought you should have really used the moment. I'm talking about the real victim, and that's Muslim. Look well, at here. They're talking about fascism of the left, Stalin, how but they never talk about how many millions they have killed and how many millions of Muslims they have killed since 9-11. That yes. is not even clear who did it. And a lot of people know who did it. They don't talk about it, including New York Times, which is spread the fake news. Yeah, so I, I, I definitely ag I agree with you. Yeah, so uh, the, and the point you're making about victims being like Israel's particular cruelty is in part due to using their own history of victimhood and then thinking that it absolves them from cru horrible cruelty to others. So that's part, same with Serbia. So, uh, so you know, Serb uh, in, in, in Kosovo and elsewhere. So the problem with using a victimization narrative a past history of victimization can make you especially cruel. My book talks a lot about Muslims because it talks a lot about India. So it talks a lot about what's happening in India with the uh, Hindutva movement. I go into detail in the sexual anxiety chapter about the uh, the uh, the Hindu uh, Hindu love jihad scandal of 2014, which goes back to the 1920s in India, where Muslims are supposed to be, you know, seducing Hindu women to convert them to Islam. So I focus on certain countries, and India is one of the countries, and there I, t and also uh, Myanmar is another country. But I can't, you know, there's, it's a short book, I can't talk about every single country, but you're absolutely right that there are many, many countries. The two countries I focus on where Muslims are the primary victims are Myanmar and India. Uh, but it's obviously in the Middle East and obviously what happened after 9-11. Uh, yeah. So, so, yeah. Um, I think that uh, I am arguing that a uh, that, uh, lot, you know, look at the Reich Ministerium for Homosexuality and Abortion. <laughs> I mean, uh, just look at, you know, I mean, if you look at the KKK, if you look at the National Socialists, uh, there's, uh, there's a certain confluence. What happens in fascist times is that there's a certain confluence of, uh, of different groups of conservatives that come together. And so what I would say, so fascism is like the extreme version of the right. Now that's cliche, but true, I think. And so it's a spectrum. So fascism, like social conservatives have no business being fascists because they're not, they're not into, they shouldn't be into social Darwinism. And libertarians have no business being fascists because they're, they, they should not apply their social Darwinist ideas and the level of individual to the level of groups. Fascists violate all those things. They viol they're libertarians, but somehow certain groups work harder and have more value. Uh, so they're not really libertarians. Uh, they're social conservatives because abortion, homo they always target homosexuality and feminism, and, but yet they're also social Darwinists. <laughs> and so, so it's this, there are elements. And, and what happens in fascist times is you have groups getting together uh, who, each, who don't all agree with each other. Like you have the libertarians partnering with the social conservatives. Like a fascist time might be one where you might see evangelicals voting for, say, a leader who's very corrupt and 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 uh, and has no business being an even voted for by evangelicals. So that's happened before, I think. And uh, and uh, so because they think, okay, you know, the enemy is the left, and they're so bad that we have to all unify like this. So at the same time, I want to say 
yes, there are elements of social conservatism. There are there are elements of different kinds of conservatism that are that are parts of fascist ideology. But you need the whole spectrum. And if you're going to fight fascism, you need to point out to people now's not the time to partner with that group. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I want to follow up on that then because I'm I'm I've been listening to just recently uh, Ben Shapiro and Jordan Peterson, um, and I'm really interested in that phenomenon. Like, what's going on here? Um, and it strikes me that that um, there is a fear. I think there's a sort of vulnerability in academia, maybe particularly a fear of a kind of dominance on the left. And so it's the one are, institution the right doesn't control. They can't bear it. Well, it, it, <laughs> sorry, that was it, a it, it, <laughs> <laughs> But but it, it's interesting that you would say that, right? That is so. So there's a sort of maybe maybe a, a sense of some kind of psychological pathology over there, but but that's being tossed back and forth. So I just wonder because what I miss is are thoughtful people on the left and thoughtful people on the right. And there are some thoughtful people on the right, and there are some thoughtful people on the left, but I'm not hearing very much of that, and that's more frightening to well, me. Well, are, are you in academia? No, not right now. Right, so, so, so I think in academia, I mean, I'm on the left, and I'm considered based, it's scary to be an academic on the left in academia. Most academics, I'm in the discipline of philosophy, which is mostly milk toast, apolitical people who just are terrified if anyone says anything political, and... Uh, you know uh, the 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 right wing the what you've been caught uh, what you've been there's this attack on universities it's international it's not just here universities are filled with leftists that's not just here they're closing down universities all over Eastern Europe does that mean that you have to defend everything that happens in universities no but the idea that universities are filled with leftists is your university filled with I mean it's it, I mean universities are filled with Clinton Democrats now are Clinton Democrats leftists. I mean, what we've got is the, the, the right wing, you know, I mean, try to be a Bernie Sanders supporter at Yale. It was not easy. Uh, you know. I don't so that understanding. That's what's the vulnerability to that? Then you can lampoon those people and you can what say, people? well, that's ridiculous. Right. But, but people who are frightened of the left. They are frightened of something. I'm frightened of universities because I'm on the left. <laughs> that's what I'm telling you. So I'm telling you, it's a myth. <laughs> I, that's so what we get. It's part of propaganda. It's part of. It's a lot safer to be in university. Universities are looking to hire conservative. But look, the right has moved much far to the right. Right has moved extreme. So when you're talking about no people on the right, universities are filled with centrists, and centrists now vote for the Democratic Party. So universities are not filled. There are some few departments. There's a few people in African American studies at Yale. Some of them uh, might be. Regarded, I mean, I don't even know what's meant by left. There's an attack everywhere on gender studies. There's an attack everywhere on any history that isn't, you know, millet, you know, th there's an attack on universities. And it really, you know, it's super intense. Like, I was in Aspen this summer and everyone just wanted to attack me for, like, you know, being, you know, how come, like, Yale is not coming down harsher on student protesters? And how come, you know, it's here just like it's in Hungary. And what I'm saying is it's not the reality. I'm a leftist in the university. I've had police squad cars parked in front of my house from right wing, the right wing media attacking me for being a leftist in a university. Like there's an attack on leftists in universities. It goes back to David Horowitz, but now it's mainstreamed. And most people in universities, yes, they're mostly Democrats because I think the Republican Party has morphed and changed. But even economics, I mean, the math department's a five to one Democrats. I mean, I don't know. I'm not going to tell the math department to go hire Republicans. Um, so, uh, so I don't, you know, I think that the people who feel the dominant group often feels attacked. I mean, I can tell you, I find it scary to be a leftist in a university. You know, I, I, I think about the economy, and um, I haven't heard much about the economy here tonight. Excellent. And, Thank uh, you. I, I rolled back and forth to Ohio um, 15 or 20 times in the last 10 years for family issues back in Ohio. And I would go through rural Ohio, and I'd see the opioid addicts, and I'd see the poverty, and nobody in Cambridge knew about it, or it, and, it, and it wasn't covered, you know? And so I always say follow the money. 
and there's no money in the rural areas, and globalism works in Boston and San Francisco, um, but it doesn't seem to work in rural America. And so I always think that globalism is doomed and democracy is doomed if they can't figure out a way to put rural Americans into this new economy. And that, that, doesn't, that, that doesn't seem to ever happen. I was, I was in southern Ohio in a family gathering in Lebanon, Ohio, and the fireman was talking to me there, was part of the group. And he said he's retiring early because he can't stand picking up opioid addicts in a little town in Ohio with 10,000 people. He's got five, six calls a day taking care of overdose people and people shooting up in cars and in the ditches and stuff. And so, yeah. Yeah, and this is little, little hometown, uh, you know, war in Ohio is dead. There's nothing going on. All the industries are closed. So, this, is so you're, last, you're, this is last week. So you're raising a couple different relate, related points, but both very important. First of all, we haven't talked much about political economy, and I think it's very important to talk about political economy. Um, as, as a factor, also in the factor in the far right movement, like what's happening. It's all right now, fascism is not, fascist politics is not being used to like buttress military empire as much as it's used to uh, other, other than Yemen. <laughs> and so it is. But, uh, but it, it, uh, it's being used to like funnel money into oligarchs' hands and blind and sort of like throw sand in the face of people with genuine economic concerns. But, the op I mean, it's not just the rural Midwest. Like my my partner is a doctor, physician in New Haven. New Haven, Connecticut has a horrific op opioid problem. I mean, the pharmaceutical companies. <laughs> I mean, they delivered a whole bunch of uh, opioids to a lot of people, and uh, and it's a problem that is uh, the deindustrialized areas. Um, I mean, op it's horrific. It's like what sixty thousand deaths last year. Uh, 70,000 deaths. So, um, so, but, uh, and, it's, and it's tricky figuring out, you know, Carl Hart's work would say it's, it's mainly an economic problem. You solve people's economic issues and they're not going to be opioid addicts. Uh, but, um, but, uh, but you're, you're, I mean, one thing about the economic anxiety point is that if you look at who was affected by the Great Recession, the group that was most affected by the Great Recession, I think, were people of color. But they didn't flee into the arms of, fa you know, they didn't start voting for, for, you know, they didn't vote for Trump. <laughs> so I, I, I don't think, so, so it can't, I think that economic, and, and then you look worldwide, my book is about the world, and you look at Poland, like the civic platform in Poland, like the civic platform expanded the GDP radically. Poland was doing really well economically. And then law and justice came in and did all these tactics and won. Look at Bavaria, one of the richest areas in the world. Bavaria is filled with this Seehofer. Uh, so the economic anxiety does not match all the areas. It can explain, it can explain why some groups in some areas fall prey to this politics. Um, but looking internationally, uh, the politics gets a grip, and even looking nationally, because it, it gets a grip on some groups and not the other others. And if you look at, if you look at, and my book is about why it gets a grip when it's so obviously a false promise. And so in the United States, when we talk about the poor working class, we too, we too, the white working class, we forget a chapter in Du Bois's Black Reconstruction is a poor white. You know, we have to talk about the psychological wages of whiteness. We have to talk about, and, and the response is, of course, an economic response, is a labor movement, a labor movement. You know, th when they smashed the labor movements in the upper Midwest, suddenly people felt much more prey to this kind of politics. And so, you know, um, so I think we do face this crisis. We need a labor movement. That's why they went after the labor movement. We're in a crisis after the Janus decision. Um, and, and so we have to rebuild the labor movement and give people economic hope. I, I'm not sure it's its globalization as much as it's the lack of a, of, a, of, of a labor movement in the United States. I mean, German manufacturing is doing fine and German labor is doing fine. I just have a question. You talked about um, uh, addressing this through history. Uh, and making history known. But uh, I guess, how do you make it known? <laughs> Given that the, um, 
I mean, given what you're talking about, you know, the, the attack on truth, the, the discrediting of sources, uh, the control of educational boards or institutions by people who might not be in their interest at this, you know. I mean, so what, uh, what's the, uh, do you have any thoughts, I guess, on that? I don't know, I don't know if that's, I mean, it's doing, it, it's having conversations like this. I mean, I think it's, it's, it's really up to us, and this is like in terms of thinking about what is the role of academics right now um, and people who do research is to, is to one, I think that qualitative research in general is just delegitimized um, and it's, it's dismissed as not being true um, despite the fact that, you know, my, I don't use, my, my data doesn't come from surveys. It's not quantitative. My data are in documents and it's the ways in which I'm interpreting those documents just like it's the ways in which other people are interpreting their quantitative data. Um, and so I think that, you know, right now the other kind of struggle going on in universities is the um, growing attack in many ways on the lib on liberal arts in general, which is tied to the developments that Jason describes so eloquently in the book. So I think part of it is, you know, doing the work of having discussions like this. It's amazing that there's so many people here and we're having this really engaged and important discussion. Um, that takes a lot out of us, but that's, I think, part of our responsibility um, as, as researchers, as scholars, as intellectuals, um, to try to write in accessible ways. Jason was just telling me that he's been on the radio for like 10 hours this week. Um, that's doing the work, that's doing that important work, and I think, Part of the difficulty is in many in in many instances we we end up kind of preaching to the choir, yeah. um, and you that's can only the, go on Berkeley. Yeah. Ra you can only go on Berkeley radio so many times. I mean, yeah. <laughs> you know. right. So 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 part of it too is also kind of moving into different spaces where we might be less comfortable. Um, when I get invited to speak with libertarian or white ring groups or. I, I'm happy to go because knowing that I might be walking into an abrasive situation, um, you know, I tried to make my book and my research um, as undeniable as possible. And I think the argument that you've laid out in this book is also undemi undeniable. And that's how I think we can begin to think about re-educating, um, re correcting the false narratives and erasing the untruths, the mythic past that's been created. And history is, I think, really, Historical work is really key to that. We don't know how we got here unless we really, really understand the past. Yeah, uh, yeah I just want I just want to say, you know, that's why Du Bois ends, uh, ends <laughs> Black Reconstruction of the Propaganda of History. And that's why he's so corny and capitalizes truth. You know, that's, that's, that's what gets me upset when people attack, for instance, African-American studies as, as uh, has been happening a lot, or, or gender studies, because they're trying to tell the actual truth of a story that's not told. And, you know, and that, that's, that's why, du, you know, Du Bois is always so corny about truth. <laughs> like, he's like, you know, uh, when, you know, erasure and, uh, erasure is never truth, <laughs> you know, uh, so... Uh, and of course, the backlash is always like a little bit of like at Yale, what happened. The, I mean, I could have told my colleagues in the English department, they added Gugi Wathiongo. This, this goes back to you. They added Gugi Wathiongo to one course. Uh, and, and there were like 20 articles from white ring media about how they're eliminating Shakespeare at Yale. And it hit them so by surprise. I was like, my colleagues in the English department, they're like, what happened? What happened? We're getting all this death threats. I'm like, yeah, you know, <laughs> you added an African writer to a required course. <laughs> um, you know, so that's the, and we, we have academic administrators here that can tell you about this. But there's, there's you know, the very idea, so true, like multiple perspectives, which doesn't mean multiple perspectives, doesn't mean there's many truths, there's only one truth, that's why Du Bois capitalizes it, but the truth involves, you know, that the, they, what happened to the indigenous populations as well as what happened to Dale Carnegie. Uh, unfortunately, we do have to move on to sign lines, so we'll get the chance to ask questions.